Stage Pierre Collignon, opinions editor at the Danish daily Berlinska, who will moderate this next conversation. Pierre. <laughs> Thank you very much, and um, uh, let me first of all uh, introduce our, our guests. I'm uh, expecting one of them will <laughs> turn up on the screen soon. Uh, I hope... Oh, there you are. Uh, welcome to, uh, to a, a link to Copenhagen, Natalia. Uh, Natalia uh, Sedletska is a very well-known investigative journalist in Ukraine, and we're happy to have you here. Our thoughts and Sympathy with you, of course, in, the, in, these, uh, in these hours. Um, it's difficult for you to travel, obviously. Um, uh, and also welcome to uh, Nancy Cooper, uh, Global Editor of Newsweek, um, and uh, Olaf Steinfart uh, from uh, Germany and from uh, the Journalism Trust Initiative. Uh, and then uh, Ginny Badanes uh, from uh, Microsoft's uh, Democracy Forward Initiative. Um, so it's, um, it's going to be, uh, of course, uh, uh, difficult, I think, uh, with uh, just 45 minutes, uh, with these uh, four uh, very interesting people to, uh, to uh, uh, fit it all into so, so short time, because it's very large topics we are discussing. Um, I, um, I, uh, I wrote myself a book about how we should fight uh, for... Uh, journalistic integrity and, and credibility in uh, the, uh, these uh, modern times uh, we live in. Um, and it was kind of a reaction on, on the big events in 2016 with the Trump election, the Brexit uh, uh, decision, and then the French election the, the year after. I think in, in the West, we had at that point a, a, a big awakening. We uh, realized uh, something had gone really wrong with uh, the, the public sphere of discourse and, and suddenly we found ourselves, I think, kind of uh, at the front line of this information that uh, some other countries had, had been, and journalists in, in Ukraine, for example, and, and Finland had been working with much longer, uh, the front line with Russian disinformation. Uh, and what we all realized, of course, was this big change in in technology and in the media landscape. There's a, a Danish uh, scholar, he calls, talks about the Gutenberg parenthesis, hmm. which was actually the end of a time in history where you could have centralized knowledge institutions that could uh, tell people uh, uh, and have uh, respect uh, for, for them almost automatically. Uh, that, that ended with the, the digital age and then with the social media, we kind of came back to a public square where we all can say something and everyone's voice is equal. And in some ways it's very democratic, but it's also very confusing. So how do we fight for truth? Um, how do we fight for, for uh, media credibility? I think we should start with you, Natalia. If you could talk to us a little bit about uh, the challenges you have in Ukraine also in, in, uh, in competition with, uh, with a lot of uh, Russian misinformation. Hello, Pierre. Hello, colleagues. Uh, it's really a pity that I cannot join uh, your summit physically because, uh, unfortunately, only Ukrainian military planes and Russian missiles fly over our sky, so it's very difficult to get abroad from Ukraine now. But thank you for your question. Indeed, and it's not only journalists, but the Ukrainian people in general have become the biggest and the most tragic, probably, victims of uh, Russian misinformation and propaganda. And millions of Russians are justifying this war, supporting and encouraging the killing of Ukrainians because they have a completely wrong idea of what is really happening in Ukraine and actually in the world as well. Um, on April 20, on April 28, uh, my colleague, Radio Liberty producer, was in her apartment in Kiev, and that day a Russian missile hit her house. My colleague had died. Her name was Vera Girich. Tens of thousands of innocent Ukrainians, including children and, and elderly as well, have died and continue dying every day because Russian propaganda has convinced the people in the neighboring country that it is deserved 
and that it is there is some justification for this so here i would also like to notice the work of ukrainian and foreign journalists who fearlessly cover what is really going on in ukraine and already more than three thousands of journalists have already laid down their lives for it um free media in you in free in general, free media is one of Vladimir Putin's strategic tar targets in this war. And it's no wonder that the first Russian rocket that fired at the peaceful city of Kiev in February hit a television tower that broadcast television and radio signals to society. And it is no wonder that the first thing that Russian army does when occupying Ukrainian territories is turning off the television signal turning off the Ukrainian mobile communications because they transmit the truth and which Kremlin is systematically and obsessively trying to suppress uh, whatever it reaches. Um, answering your question, um, I work for Radio Svoboda, Radio Liberty, uh, Radio Free Europe uh, in the Ukrainian service and our media is having a high rating of trust from Ukrainians which we value the most. And currently, our journalists are working in hotspots and covering Russians' attack on Ukraine uh, around the clock. Um, saying for me, I lead a team of investigative journalists, and our project is called Schemes. By February 2022nd, we were mainly investigating major political corruption, oligarchy, Russian uh, influence uh, on Ukrainian politics. But with the beginning of full-scale invasion, we changed our focus, and now using our investigative skills and tools, we are investigating the actions of the Russian army in Ukraine, the genocide of the Ukrainian people. We name those soldiers who commit war crimes here, uh, not only in Bucha, which the whole world was uh, already able to know about, but everywhere in Ukraine where the foot of Russian soldier um, stepped. And it is difficult to work um, with the temporary occupied territories, but we are trying to reach there as well. For example, access to satellite technologies has helped us locating uh, mass graves in occupied Mariupol. And this work by itself, I think, is debunking the myths of Russian propaganda. Probably another short example is Russian flagship Moskva. As you remember, it was hit by, Russia, by Ukrainian army and Russian defense ministry was stating that all personnel, and it's about 500 people, uh, survived and there uh, no soldiers died. And we were able to identify at least at least dozens of soldiers who were on the flagship and we talked with their relatives and many of them were not informed what actually happened to, uh, to their sons or to their husbands and they got to know about it from us, Ukrainian reporters. So, in short, I think the main response to misinformation and propaganda is professional, high-quality journalism, necessarily objective, based on journalistic standards, focused on the interests of individual society and the planet as a whole, and at the same time, such journalism must be modern, vibrant, and supported by technologies, both at the stage of its creation and at the stage of dissemination. Great, great. And a lot of great work you've done recently. Uh, thank you for that. And, uh, and, and again, uh, it's so sad to hear about your colleague. Um, uh, I, I would, should need to say also, uh, if you want to ask some questions to any of the panelists, feel free to uh, type in uh, in your, your app and they will turn up on the screen, I'm told. Uh, and then uh, we'll try and fit them in. Um, thank you very much, uh, Natalia. Uh, let's let's uh, talk a little bit about technology then, uh, Jeannie. Uh, perhaps you could tell us uh, what is exactly this uh, democracy uh, initiative that the Microsoft is working on. In short, in what, short. what is it? What is it you do? <laughs> Um, thank you for the question. Uh, so the Democracy Forward initiative really started with the idea of what are the threats facing democracy and what is the role of the tech sector in combating those? Pretty simple concept. And initially we looked at uh, the cyber threats against democratic institutions, attacks against uh, campaigns, elections, um, and a lot of that was familiar given the framing that you provided of the 2016 election, what we saw in France and other things. That continues to be an area of concern and an area where we're focused and have a lot of work. Um, but in the last year or so, we have, as you heard from 
Brad, we've given a lot of thought to what are the newer emerging challenges and threats uh, to democracy, and it's impossible to look at that and not be aware of the information ecosystem and the impact that that has when you look at how information uh, can turn into offline harm. Um, obviously, the war is a uh, excellent and tragic example of that, but we have others uh, that we can display and look at as well. And so from Microsoft's perspective, we acknowledge that technology is both um, a tool for good, but it can also be used as a weapon. And so we are stakeholders in this, whether we want to be or not, we are stakeholders. Um, and so we have an obligation to do more. Um, part of what we did when having sort of that analysis of where do we belong, where can we be impactful was uh, looking at the field of journalism and just acknowledging that there is a lot to be said for how you uh, defend against disinformation, which is an effort that we absolutely take seriously and have programs around. But there's also the question of how do you highlight authoritative information? How do you encourage an ecosystem where there is more good information that is out there? Um, and because we have technology platforms where anyone can be a journalist, you know, as far as um, information being spread, there is the question of trust. How do you get to a point where you can trust the news that you're consuming? Um, and who are the, uh, the ones to decide that? Um, which is, you know, a, a loaded question I recognize. But it's one of the reasons that we um, applaud the, the work that Olaf is doing um, with the trust indicators. It's one of the reasons we work with partners like NewsGuard and Global Disinformation Index. We look at these third parties who, um, who can really identify whether publishers are living up to journalistic standards. Um, I, I'm going to uh, allow myself a, 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 an egocentric question because I'm, I'm from a, a, a Danish newspaper, uh, and um, of course you're not a social media company, but, but this, the big social media companies kind of destroyed our uh, yeah. business model. Uh, uh, <laughs> and and uh, so we want our money back. Uh, <laughs> no, but but how, how, uh, how, how can big tech actually help do something about the yeah. financing of quality journalism, mm -hmm. because we're all, it's all great work uh, that Microsoft also is doing and, and Facebook is also doing some interesting stuff. But, but um, uh, the evilish commentary would be that it's kind of blood money uh, after having killed the business model. Uh, so when we started the journalism initiative within this program, um, we focused on key areas where we could help journalism and the first one was the business model. Mm -hmm. Acknowledging that technology is what undermined the existing business model. That's not to say that you can just go back and recreate it, right? We've all moved on, we're in a digital age, but there are new ways that that can be approached. So we've done a bunch of pilots so far in the United States where we've been looking at how to reinvent the business model and working with community foundations at a local level. How can local news, because local news is so important um, uh, everywhere, and, and we've acknowledged that in the US, we think disinformation appears to be consumed at higher levels where local news has declined. And so how can we help rebuild that local news ecosystem, but not try and recreate the past and not be nostalgic for how things used to be? So one of the things we've been experimenting with, along with a lot of other foundations, is can we get to the point where we agree that local Local news is a community good, like your local park or your local museum. Can we create an environment where foundations, the local business community, and others contribute to it? That's one way. The other way is obviously paying publishers for the work that they do. Um, that's a policy that Microsoft's had for a very long time. I think since 2004, we've, um, we've I don't want to say given out because it's not charity, they did the work, but we've given uh, over a billion dollars back to the news industry for news that's showing up on our platforms. Um, so that's an important thing and something that we're not perfect at, but we're continuing to lean into that. Mm -hmm. Great, great. Uh, be good to see uh, uh, some of the others uh, moving, moving on that as well. Um, I think, Olaf, uh, maybe that's a, a cue to you. Uh, but of course, uh, first, you, you, I think it would be interesting for, for you to explain to us, uh, in short, what the Journalism Trust Initiative does. Yes, thank you very much for the opportunity, and in doing so, maybe I would like to highlight this kind of defining moment where, as you just explained, uh, tech companies are more and more venturing towards human rights, and a human rights NGO like Reporters Without Borders, where I work, and the JTI is one of our projects, is producing a piece of technology. And I think this is a, a huge opportunity to really define and also um, capitalize on the overlap this, this development has. So what exactly is the JTI? Um, essentially, it's uh, a compliance tool, an internal compliance tool for newsrooms. It really starts with a deep look into the mirror. 
uh, and asking, are we as a professional a community are living up to our own professional norms and what happens if we don't? The novelty of the JTI lies into turning this internal compliance into uh, an instrument of external transparency and accountability. And this is what really matters when we speak about discoverability, which then translates into reach and hopefully revenues. And this is not only about the ordinary citizen and the consumer, but it is about the whole range of stakeholders a media outlet interacts with. So we talk about advertisers, we talk about regulators, we talk about, talk about donors and philanthropists, and of course, last but not least, uh, we talk about tech companies. And this is, at the end of the day, a question of a real-time machine-readable signal that can feed into the recommender systems, into search, into social media, and maybe even more importantly, into programmatic advertising as a, as a positive list. And I should also add that the JTI, and this is the second novelty, is built on an official isotype industry standard. And the added value is that this is also um, certifiable. And we believe that this adds um, an additional level of accountability to this whole, to this whole equation. And we were just talking uh, backstage that you, you're also working uh, in the uh, European Commission expert panel on, on fake news and disinformation. And there's been this, this work on a, a uh, code of conduct for social media companies where, where uh, maybe a kind of your tool could, could also be, become uh, a part of a solution. Could you, could you explain that? Yes, Vice President Jourova just earlier mentioned the uh, DSA and the Code of Practice on Disinformation, which is a subset of the DSA. And actually, we've been sitting together at the negotiation table over the last six months or so. Tech companies, other signatories to the Code of Practice. And it includes specific commitments of stakeholders. And one of those in the chapter of uh, empowering, empowering users is to make use of trustworthiness indicators, not only to empower users and basically display additional information about trustworthy sources, but also to feed it into the recommender systems, which would, in the best case, um, mean and uh, provide a competitive advantage. And if you wish, an, a return on investment on ethical journalism. And this is what we believe could indeed be a game changer, provided that these trustworthiness indicators are actually implemented across the board. And the Code of Practice on Disinformation is including this exact commitment. So this is why there's hope. It would be great if it could work. Uh, when, when, uh uh, I'm sure you all remember the crazy, crazy stories from 2016 when pop-up media in, in uh, the Balkans uh, suddenly t behaved as if they were American media and writing crazy stories about, uh, about the presidential election. So the U.S. is uh, uh, in many ways uh, kind of uh, gone crazy. Uh, <laughs> sorry, <Nancy. laughs> uh, sorry, and it's really difficult to be a, a, a media company in, in, a, in a political environment that is uh, uh, so divisive. Um, so um, the Trump era, what has that learned you uh, as, as a journalist? How, 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 what's the biggest learning point for you to... to, uh, to that's a very good question, and I think um, the startling lesson is that it was good for the media in that we had a bunch of assumptions, this is how the world works, this is what people in America want, and, and many of them were overturned. And many uh, media organizations felt, you know what, we missed this story. And I can remember the night of the 2016 election, and we had a whole story, uh, this is really confidential, but a whole story list of <laughs> Biden wins stories. Biden wins, what happens to immigration, what does he do about the economy? And, you know, I don't think about eight o'clock, nine o'clock at night, Eastern time, it became clear that Trump would win. Uh, sorry, not Biden, Hillary Clinton. would win. And, you know, we all sort of froze, and then we thought, okay, we have to pull together a, a Trump wins story list, which, you know, we obviously did, but it told us we were out of touch. We didn't really know. Now, how he won the election was complicated, and it wasn't that we had missed some enormous signpost uh, of a poll that said he would win. But still, the media had not, in general, really taken seriously uh, his candidacy and his chances of winning, and we had to play catch-up. And I feel in some ways we played catch-up for the next four years and, and these years. And I want to go back to something Olaf said, because I think it was the most important word, which is transparency. We, Newsweek, want to be trusted. We want you to say, I read it in Newsweek, I'm pretty sure that's accurate. But I can't control whether you trust us. I don't control that. I control whether I feel we are trustworthy. 
So that is how we approach our jobs, is what does it need to be trustworthy? What would it take for you to trust somebody in your own personal life? And one of those big things, again, to use a word both of you used, I think, is transparency. This is what we got wrong. That's incredibly important to say. We wrote this, we're sorry, we got it wrong, we've corrected it, here's our list of corrections. Um, also just, uh, you know, what are our sources? Of course, we don't reveal confidential sources, but you say, this is a person with an agenda. This is a person who comes from this side of the debate, or this is a person who used to be in this business but isn't anymore. It's very important to identify that for people. And also just the limits of what we know are important to say. I, we don't know, I don't think, who is winning in Ukraine. You know, we don't know what will happen. We didn't know about the pandemic. Uh, you know, I'll tell you an example. At Newsweek, we have a very, uh, very well-sourced, very intelligent science reporter, and he wrote in 2020 that he thought uh, that it was clear from reporting and, and medical papers that the pandemic may have come from a lab leak in China. And that was anathema to American media that was opposed to Trump. That had been politicized as something like, you can't say that, that's just being pro-Trump. But that's what our reporting showed, and we published it. And both, the, I have to say, the Washington Post and the New York Times slammed us for that and said, this is nonsense, this is just propaganda. And of course, two years later, I think that the consensus is there's a very real chance that there was a lab leak from Wuhan. You know, personally, would I like the Washington Post and the New York Times to admit that they were wrong and we were right? No, but they shouldn't do it for me, Newsweek. They should do it for their readers. They should say, we wrote this in good faith. We weren't trying to be on one side of the political debate or another. This is what we knew, and now it's clear that we didn't know everything. But, but do you think that also is because uh, some of the American media have become just too biased? Uh, I, I, I do, and I don't want to... It's a very tough job, obviously, and I don't want to be criticizing them, but I think that a lot of the news organs were used to being sort of up the middle. You know, we represent middle America, middle brow, middle of the political spectrum, and there doesn't seem to be a middle anymore. So what we've done at Newsweek is take on uh, fairness and a mission statement that says we listen to people across the spectrum, both sides of the spectrum, as long as it's a good faith argument. You know, I don't want to publish things where somebody is deliberately promoting misinformation, but you have to steel yourself to run something you profoundly disagree with, as long as it's an honest argument. And I feel, I'm hopeful, that that's the way to create, in the end, I hope, some kind of trust for the media, which I think is very important for democracy, and also some kind of civil conversation, which I think many of us agree there hardly seems to be anymore. Mm -hmm. So we, we have a mission statement that says we listen to and, and publish views across the spectrum from our readers. Different voices, different views, uh, you know, as long as they are a part of an honest debate. And I hope that will be, it works for us and we believe in it, you know, whether other media want to take that as a model is up to them. Thanks. Um, uh, there's a question here, uh, which is uh, a bit provocative, so I'll take that. Uh, I don't know who wrote it. <laughs> I'd say it's not me. I'm not, I'm not saying it. Uh, no, but the, the, uh, the question is, is very uh, to the point. Uh, is, isn't the concept of news media itself, and I'm going to turn that to you, Natalia, is, is the idea of news media not just outdated? with this technological landslide and revolution we have, we have seen. Uh, so uh, what's your feeling, what's your experience now in the information war that you are leading? Uh, how, how does a news media concept make sense to you? And, yeah, and to your audience, of course. Right. Um, I think it is a question about, as well, digitalization and whether um, it's for good or for, for bad. And, of course, it is both. And it is absolutely true that it is greater access to information, greater ability to understand information needs, uh, greater ability to get information and reach people. But at the same time, it is, it is true that... Uh, we have content overload for audience. Uh, it is much harder to stand out with 
fair reporting, fair news reporting. Uh, sometimes it's hard to compete with um, the no-name anonymous Telegram channels. It's very popular in, in, in Ukraine and Russia uh, that, that has millions of uh, subscribers, but uh, spreading biased information or even lies. Does it mean that news uh, concept has to be updated? Let me explain you it, I'm sorry, I will bring again Ukrainian and Ukrainian examples uh, that's where we live now. And, but I want to share you a specific uh, task that we have now. And um, as an example, when digitalization is playing and can play both roles. Um, as a journalist who is obliged to obtain socially significant information, I think every day about those who is now under uh, Russian occupation. Uh, the whole world uh, learned about Bucha, Irpen, Hostom, right? Uh, about the genocide that took place uh, at uh, the, uh, this um, uh, region near Kiev uh, uh, before Russian army was forced to leave under the pressure, of course, um, from the Ukrainian military. But think about it now. Uh, now under the control of the Russian army in the south and in the eastern part of Ukraine is an area three times the size of Denmark. Mm. And Ukrainians are being killed and robbed there now. They are not allowed to leave uh, to non-occupied part of Ukraine. They live in fear, millions of people right now. And what is the role of journalism? What is the challenge of journalists who, who, uh, who and our mission? Is, is our challenge is how to obtain, just simply obtain information from the occupied territories where Russian propaganda constructs its reality on a complete lies and where there is absolutely no physical access to, uh, for free media to such territories. And technologies and dig digitalization actually uh, partially to help here and not to uh, harm. Uh, some of the topics that our team investigates remotely now with the help of modern technologies, for example, is how Russia right now is stealing Ukrainian grain from the occupied territories and export it by, uh, by the sea uh, from Ukrainian uh, occupied Crimea. Another story to tell that I uh, mentioned already uh, about mass graves of innocent Ukrainian victims that are already counted in uh, tens of thousands. Right now, we have a task to investigate what is going on in the so-called filtration camps, which Russia organized in the 21st century. And another issue, forced depu deportation. You can't imagine, but thousands of people are being deported from Ukraine to Russia, and relatives cannot simply find them there. So how to reach this information, how to tell the stories, how to cover these huge problems, I think only with the, with the completely objective, independent, traditional, let's say, well done, vibrant journalism. And the challenges are huge and we, we try to solve two problems at once, how to get information from such hostile environment and of course, how to reach the audience. And uh, we always keep looking for solutions, including technological ones, and we need help of the world, uh, including technical giants and platforms. I hope I hope you get it. Yes. Well deserved applause. Um, uh, the one big debate in 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 this uh, uh, in in this fight is is the the dilemma. Should we? Uh, fight uh, disinformation, for example, Russian disinformation. Should we fight that with uh, some kind of uh, censorship? Should should we uh, ask uh, social media to take down more content, or should we work more on strengthening uh, the uh, free media and strengthening also the public's uh, uh, media literacy? So which which. Uh, uh, which end of the of the balance do we want to to put our 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 efforts in? And and uh, Ginny, maybe what, what which philosophy do you prefer of the two? Uh, <clears throat> well, 
I'm going to say the thing I told all if I wasn't going to say earlier today, which is <laughs> there is no silver bullet. Um, you can't have a panel where disinformation is discussed where someone doesn't say that, but it's because it's so true. Yeah. Um, there are, there's not one solution to this very, very huge problem. There are a lot of solutions and there are a lot of players who have to be involved. Um, we've been traveling, my team and I have been traveling to um, Finland and to Sweden this week, in part to have conversations about the work that they've done with media literacy, really at the, like, the educational, like, childhood level. How have they built up, um, particularly in Finland, but in both countries, how have they built up communities that are so resilient to disinformation, and not only that, they still trust journalism. Yeah. And what is it that's been done societally? And of course, you know, it's apples and oranges to compare uh, Sweden to the United States, right? I recognize there are a myriad of differences there, but part of it has been the investment that they've made in media literacy at the childhood level, teaching things like in math class, they talk about how you can manipulate statistics to prove a point. Um, they talk about uh, at the very young kindergarten age, they tell stories about Sly Fox who's trying to get you to do something. You know, I mean, they've really done a great job, I think, and not suggesting that that's going to work everywhere, but it means media literacy does matter and societal resilience is a part of this. Um, but that's not the only solution because creating a, a resilient society is not enough when it is a fire hose of information coming at them. There are technolo technological tools that need to be put into place. I wouldn't say censoring, but I would say lifting up authoritative and suppressing less authoritative sources is one way to sort of turn the spigot so that when people are facing this information, it's not so much that they can't manage it or deal with what they're seeing. And then there is a role in the middle for the, um, for the uh, technology players to, to play as well, whether it's identifying, hunting down threat actors, as Brad was referring to, not just on the cyber side, but also on the disinformation side, that's really important. And then going back to the word transparency, being transparent about what we all find. I think we've seen some real success um, just recently with the US government, for example, pointing out narratives before they really took hold and saying, this is what Russia is going to say next. And it just takes the wind out of the sail of that argument. It doesn't mean everyone's not going, there aren't people who are going to believe it. You're not going to stop it. But if you put all of those pieces into place, you've got civil society, you've got academia, you've got technology companies, and then society themselves, mm -hmm. and you're doing a, a variety of these things, I, th I think we do get to a place where, maybe I'm being idealistic, but where disinformation is more manageable and not just feeling so overwhelming. Um, maybe just quickly uh, seconding this, I think we also con consider the JTI as a building block. The problem with the building block is if it's just one building block sitting there, it doesn't make much difference. So we need many building blocks and they need to fit together. I think this is what does the trick. And if we zoom out a little and look at the overall, not only fight against disinformation, but I think also the experience collectively we, we, we saw over the last years with this, this topic, I think the problem is that the main principle was um, resilience and repair, mm -hmm. which means a little bit like accepting that all this toxic crap is out there and then educating people to cope. And fact checking is also like debunking problematic content that's out there already. And the problem here is that it puts all the responsibility on the weakest point in the, in the chain, which is the end consumer. Mm -hmm. It's a bit like saying, hey, we know uh, the drinking water from the tab is toxic, but hey, here are some testing strips and a colorful brochure. Happy surviving. <laughs> and this is not fair. And this is why we believe we need safety by design. We need systems that are already, to, to a certain extent, operating and providing uh, safety. And the second problem is most responses, be it technology or be it, uh, be it regulatory, to disinformation up to today are all about sanctions, deleting harmful content, chasing malicious actors, and I think all parents in the room know if you want to impact behavior, sanctions alone never work. You need also incentives, and this is, I think, what, what we are trying to, to bring to the table. So what do you think about the, the European Commission and, and, and the EU policy on uh, the Russian media outlets, uh, RT and Sputnik? Was it a good decision to shut them down? Is this what you mean by, by safety by design? Or is it going too far? No, this was a purely political decision. I think everybody was holding his breath because the European Commission, to begin with, has no mandate to make this decision. And still it happened, like the very next day. But do you think it's a good idea? Even, um, personally, I don't. No. Because it basically um, provides an additional uh, 
totally unnecessary argument to the other side to say, you know, we are the martyrs. Um, I mean, RT is taking it to the courts right now, and I don't know how this will turn out. And, and Nancy, on, on these two big philosophies, uh, it's also a discussion in the US, it's a discussion everywhere, of course. Yes, I, I'm I was going to say something which Olaf has now embarrassed me about, but I will say it anyway, <laughs> that I think part of it is respecting the consumer, the end consumer of the media and the audience, and, and you're quite right, it can't be completely on them. It's like if the FDA in, in uh, the USA, that's the Food and Drug Administration, which says a drug is safe. If they put anything on the market and said, up to you, and if you die, well, that's on you, we would not be happy about that. And in a sense, that's what the media is or has been doing. It's all out there, you figure it out. I do think that with more transparency, as we're discussing, more just knowledge, this is how we got the story, this is where the story is from, this is the contradictory evidence, this is a contradictory opinion. Also, just making sure that we contextualize what we write. I do think that helps the audience to understand it. I think it's fair. There are very few stories that don't need some context for you to assess them fairly. Um, and I think it educates the audience to be more resistant to, dis to, resistant to disinformation. But you're also right that it's very important for the media itself to say we have to hold ourselves to high standards. We can't just throw anything out there and then be mad at the audience that they believed it. It is on us to fact check things. And I think that some of these trust projects, fact checking projects Newsweek has um, are very important. And I have to say, and this is a sort of uncomfortable thing to think about at this, at this moment, we all know there's Russian propaganda and that has to be fact checked and contextualized. In any war, there's propaganda on both sides. And we have to treat uh, things that we hear from Ukraine in the same way. You know, we don't have to take Russia's side, as it were, but I think it's fair to contextualize it and to say, this is what this ambassador said, here is what we know about what's on the ground, if it's slightly contradictory, if it supports what the person said or not. But otherwise, it's very easy to fall into this, we believe this side, this side is nonsense, and that's not fair. That's not good journalism, it's not honest, and it's not truth. So we all have to, you know, wince. And when you look at something and say, oh, I wish I didn't have to read this, I wish I didn't have to publish it. But if it's as accurate as you can make it and you have reason to believe that it's accurate, you, you have to be willing to be uncomfortable and to make your audience uncomfortable. But you, you, you don't sound like you're so much a fan of protecting people from dangerous information. You think it's, it's, it's you know, better to, to I, uh, I don't be know out where there the line and, is. And, and fight about I, facts and... First of all, I think that ship how, has failed. Just, sorry, uh, yes, how, right. how, what do you think about uh, Donald Trump? Uh, is, is it right that, that he's uh, not allowed on Twitter and, and Facebook, for example? Is, that, is, is this a an, way forward? It's an interesting question. I think that at the time when Twitter moved against him and other social media, they were genuinely concerned about uh, civil disruption, you know, dangerous civil disruption, not just arguments, but actual violence. And they had a reason to think that. They weren't making that up. You know, a year later, a year and a half later, as we now are, I th think you probably have to assess that. I do think that America was certainly built on the idea that we have freedom of speech, freedom of information, and we allow the populace to figure out what they think. And I think that we've also seen that there is no democracy without a really, truly free press. People vote in Afghanistan, they vote in Russia. But who thinks that's a democracy? Mm because there's no press, because there's no accountability. And that means that the press has to make itself uncomfortable and unwelcome and unpleasant by saying, look, we have to tell you this thing. You know, we have to tell you that uh, COVID problem, you know, may well come from a lab leak, even though you don't want to do what you think is Trump propaganda. You know, this is what the reporting shows. I think it's, the media has to be a grown up, the audience also. Mm -hmm. And I do just want to say, sorry, as a news magazine, a long-time news magazine person, when Time magazine first started, they had no bylines. They, they all wrote in, invisibly with what they literally referred to as the voice of God. Mm -hmm. We're never going to get back to that, and, and who wants to? Yes, we have a multiplicity of views now and a multiplicity of facts, so-called facts. And that's complicated, and it's hard, and it's disturbing. But I don't think any of us want to say, well, I just, I just want to hear one thing from the voice of God. No, no. Uh, we cannot turn, turn time back any, no. anyway, so we have to find other, 
other solutions. Uh, they, 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 in Ukraine, there is a, a, a kind of similar discussion because uh, there are uh, some worries about press freedom now. Uh, that the uh, Zelensky government may be going too far in trying to uh, control the, uh, the media sphere in this time of national crisis. Uh, Natalia, how, how do you feel about that? Oh, that's a very vibrant question, of course, um, and probably even provocative as we are on the disinformation panel, <laughs> the panel about disinformation. But it's a very uh, vibrant question about journalism in a country at war. Um, especially, especially for local journalists, because we are, first of all, we are Ukrainians and then we are journalists, right? And not vice versa. So, but let's think why does democracy needs free media? I think that is because the society having complete and unbiased information will make better decisions about its life and future. But during the war, decisions need to be made urgently and many times uh, throughout the day or hours and of course uh, in hot phase of the war it is a question of country's survival and th these that's why there are these wartime laws laws which are also aimed uh, to not use not let use information as a weapon against ukraine as well so I think the question is whether it is enough trust uh, in society to the government to take this fast and urgent decisions. And mm. now Ukraine is um, united as never before. And confidence in the country's leadership is huge. Uh, they showed uh, themselves very strong from the very beginning and very stable. Probably even more uh, higher trust uh, is in the armed forces of Ukraine, uh, in the Ukrainian army, on which there is now all hope. Um, so, of course, the war leaves an imprint on journalism, and we are, as editors and journalists, always uh, have to make hard decisions. But I try to follow three principles now during time of war. It's objectivity and journalistic standards are important and crucial. The interest of society is above all, and journalism should not harm. That's also true in times of war, when the fate of the country is uh, is decisive, is, is, is under decision right now. Um, so I call it a critical responsibility of the, pro of the pro profession in times of war. Um, are there any cases of counterproductive actions of the Ukrainian authorities? Yes, of course, they are. For example, it is unacceptable for the government to crack down on political opponents under the guise of war, or uh, unless, of course, it is, uh, we're not talking about pro-Russian uh, politicians who are collaborators of the aggressor's country. Uh, it is also unacceptable to selectively restrict freedom of speech. There must be principles and rules that are the same for everyone. And uh, Ukrainian journalists are having this dialogue with the authorities looking for this balance, how to convey information and not to harm. So but just let's not underestimate the um, uh, strong, how strong and uh, Ukrainian civil society is. And Ukraine is not Russia. And I don't believe that Ukrainian society and brave Ukrainian army would allow the country to go in the wrong direction. Great, thank you very much. Uh, and um, uh, really the, the voice of, of a very, very, uh, very much wisdom in, in your three uh, journalistic principles there. I think uh, you should come to Denmark and teach <laughs> in our uh, Danish schools of, of journalism. Uh, because with the, working under the conditions you are uh, is, is very, very interesting for us to understand uh, how, how you are coping. So, um, Natalia, uh, thank you again. And thank you uh, also here uh, to, to, to all three of you here on the panel. Uh, this, this is uh, the end of this discussion. Um, and uh, we had just uh, no more questions here. But, uh, yeah. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Natalia, you were great. <laughs>